have a very special guest that I'm pleased, honored, proud oh, to present my. to you this morning. Good heavens. <laughs> Lee Remick, out. welcome to Nebraska. Thank Lee. you very much. I think the most favorite, I haven't seen everything that you've done, but I've seen a large body of your work. And to me, the Days of Wine and Roses really stands out as something oh, special. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. The review said at the time, Lemon was memorable and Remick was unforgettable. Oh, how nice. I don't remember that quote. That's, I'm glad I showed up. <laughs> there are certain faces that speak volumes. Others are a closed book. The face of Lee Remick is at once so open and so closed that it immediately puts you in the ambitious position of never quite knowing who it is you're facing. Miss Remick's open face speaks of candor and innocence. Her closed face suggests an individual reluctance to express deep feelings. But it is precisely this duality of appearance that finally intrigues. This description of Lee Remick is not only a perfect summary of her on-screen personality, but also her entire career as an actress who seems both familiar but also a mystery. Specializing in playing rather neurotic or sensual women while cultivating an image as a kind of all-American wholesome girl from next door, she seems often mostly remembered as the fifth best actress contender in 1962, the one who did not fit into a category like her co-nominees. Not a legend like Catherine Hepburn or Betty Davis, neither a respected stage performer like Anne Bancroft or Geraldine Page, but also not a true newcomer as she had been in motion pictures for a couple of years by the time Days of Wine and Roses immortalized her name as an Academy Award nominee. Instead, her nomination was the case of a promise fulfilled, a clear sign that the trust producers and directors had put into her had paid off and that, no matter if she would win the award or not, hers would undoubtedly be an important career as one of Hollywood's most relevant leading ladies. However, 1962 would ultimately not be the beginning of this career, but rather its peak. And while Lee Remick kept acting until her death in 1991, she never again achieved this level of acclaim and popularity with critics and audiences as during her first years in the business. The right ingredients for a more prominent legacy were certainly all there. A star making appearance at a young age, the desire to develop as a performer, an Academy Award nomination just after a few years in the business and collaborations with directors such as Otto Preminger, Ilya Kazan, Blake Edwards, Robert Mulligan or Martin Ritt and co-stars like Jack Lemmon, Paul Newman, James Stewart, Steve McQueen or... You got to work with Burton, Richard Burton yes. and the Tempest. Yes, I did. And now he's dead. Oh, yes. So in this video, I want to take a look at Lee Remick's career, her promising start at a young age, how she was perceived by the media and promoted by the studio, and why she never achieved the same kind of status as her 1962 co-nominees or many other actresses from her era. And of course, I will also talk about her performance in Days of Wine and Roses, which secured Lee Remick a place in this legendary Best Actress lineup. And Lee Remick in Days of Wine and Roses. While many of my videos on Best Actress nominees begin with stories of poverty and hardships, the case of Lee Remick is actually the opposite. With her mother being an actress and her father owning a department store, she had a childhood of both financial stability and an early introduction into artistic possibilities. Her main interest at the time was to become a dancer and she studied both ballet and modern dance until the age of 18. However, her mother had also convinced her to join her school's drama club at the age of 12, where her first acting job was as the second Mrs. De Winter in Rebecca. Well, the acting bug was not the first one that bit, actually. I started as a dancer and uh, I studied dancing from the time I was about eight years old here in New York. And then my first jobs were as a dancer, but then I began to get little bitty acting parts and I got to like that an awful lot better and I was better at it, so that took over. While her focus remained on dancing, producers and agents who saw her on the stage immediately noticed her natural poise and presence, which they felt would also make her a perfect fit for straight dramatic productions. And so, despite hardly any acting experience, she was given her first acting job at the age of 17 in the Broadway show Be Your Age in 1953. However, this is not the A Star Is Born moment you might expect now, as the show got mostly terrible reviews and closed after only 5 performances. Still, it was a first entry into the world of acting that got Lee Remick an agent as an actress and jobs in various TV productions over the coming years, 
working with actors like Paul Muni and Fran Chatone. Realizing that being an actress was by now a full-time job, Lee Remick would also drop her dancing ambitions. As she said, Many times as an actress I feel crazy, yet the truth is that I would feel far more crazier if I were not an actress. Her TV work would then catch the eyes of director Ilya Kazan, who was looking for the right actress for a small role in his upcoming movie A Face in the Crowd. During her audition, Kazan asked Lee Remick to improvise various scenes, something that was completely new to her. As mentioned in my Geraldine Page video, Kazan was used to working with experienced performers, often coming from the actor's studio, deeply immersed in their characters. And he certainly did not get this with Lee Remick, who lacked any formal training by this point, saying, I started lessons once, but then I got an acting job. However, her natural talent and personality immediately won her the approval of Kazan and the part. He would still, however, introduce her to the world of the actor's studio and asked her to live in Arkansas in preparation for a role and also to learn baton twirling even if they ultimately use the double. Do you remember first movie? Of course, your first big film was Facing the Crowd. Oh, yes, that was that was a thrill for me. It Which really is still was. a classic of a film. Yeah, it works right? well. Yes, My it was great. Word. A great experience. Do you have any memories of that at all? Oh, sure. Well, panic, first of all. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and not knowing anything about what was happening. And you know? working with the top director yes, ever in motion. Yes, I was very lucky and uh, it, was, it was a super experience all the way around and I learned so much. You know, right. that's what it's all about. Even if a face in the crowd offered her just a small part, this now was her A Star Is Born moment, with many reviews singling out her work and her personality, complimenting her provocative energy and drawing comparisons to Carol Baker, who had equally been discovered by Kazan just one year earlier. And Lee's success in the role would also bring her a contract with 20th Century Fox. She had officially become a movie actress. And she planned to star opposite two of the biggest movie stars in the world next, when she was considered for a supporting role in Desk Set with Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, but Tracy himself actually talked her out of taking it, advising her to choose a more relevant project instead. So she would appear in a prominent supporting part in The Long Hot Summer, when the initial choice for the role, Joanne Woodward, was moved up to the lead after a breakthrough with The Three Faces of Eve. And Lee Remick's own big breakthrough came when she again took over a part initially planned for another actress, when she was cast in Otto Preminger's Anatomy of a Murder, after the original choice, Lana Turner, had left the production. It was the first true exposure of Lee Remick, a relevant part in a prestige picture with seasoned co-stars. And reviewers agreed that she had passed the test with flying colors, calling hers a wonderful performance and saying that she gave her believability to the part that Lana Turner certainly would have missed. Following Anatomy of a Murder, Lee Remick continued to appear in some TV productions, including a remake of Loretta Young's The Farmer's Daughter. Would you be considered a young leading woman? I think so, yeah. A young Swedish leading woman. But she also worked with Montgomery Clift in Wild River, again under the direction of Ilya Kazan, who had specifically insisted on Lee's casting over the choice of the studio, Marilyn Monroe. Kazan would later compliment Lee Remick's devotion to her craft and called her one of the finest young actresses. Lee herself would often remember Wild River as her personal favorite. little movie you did with him, Wild River, what was one of his few flops. And one of my favorites of all of the movies I've ever done. I adored that film. Mm. I adored working with him again in a, in a role that allowed me more, more scope than, than the Face in the Crowd piece did. Um, and working with Monty Clift and Joe Van Fleet as well. And I loved that piece. I just, mm. you know, it was very special. It, d it did lie there at the time. Since then, it's become, uh, you know, it's, it's been seen a great deal on television. It becomes sort of a cultish type film, you know. Lots of people know it now and, and remember it and mm. mention it and so forth. But I think it's some of, of uh, my best work. Mm. With her first movie appearances, Lee Remick had established herself as the kind of disciplined, easygoing and charming actress that would enchant directors and co-stars just as easily as her audiences. This positive reputation, combined with her big overnight success and the impressiveness of her natural talents, made a strong case for a promising career as one of Hollywood's new major stars. And 1962 was the year when this promise seemed fulfilled. Joe and Kirsty, they fall in love, completely in love. These are their days of wine and roses. Days of Wine and Roses, 
A story about a married couple whose lives are destroyed by their increasing alcoholism had its initial premiere as a Playhouse 90 TV production in 1958, starring Cliff Robertson and Piper Laurie. But when 20th Century Fox acquired the rights to the story at the beginning of the 60s, the studio felt that, in order to make this depressing tale a box office success, it needed bigger names behind and in front of the camera. John Frankenheimer, who had directed Days of Wine and Roses on TV, was having his big breakthrough in 1962 with All Fall Down, Birdman of Alcatraz and The Manchurian Candidate. His busy schedule would not make him available to direct Days of Wine and Roses for the big screen as well, which was just fine for 20th Century Fox, as the new movie was supposed to have a slightly lighter touch than on TV, making it a bit more humorous, entertaining and relatable. To balance this mix of comedy and drama, the studio hired director Blake Edwards, who had a lot of experience with comedies such as Operation Petticoat and Breakfast at Tiffany's, but had done film noir as well and also knew how to handle bigger names after working with the likes of Tony Curtis, Cary Grant or Audrey Hepburn. And Edwards also came up with the ideal actor for Days of Wine and Roses central role of Joe Clay. This is the same man. How can he be so different? What happened to Joe Clay? By 1962, Jack Lemmon was already an Oscar winner for Best Supporting Actor and had established himself as one of Hollywood's most popular leading men with comedies like Some Like It Hot and The Apartment. But while his work was always lauded and brought him a ton of respect and even more Oscar nominations, he began to feel that he was being typecast as easygoing neurotics. Comedy was maybe more difficult than drama, but it didn't get the same kind of respect. Why is there still this feeling though among so many people that comedy is somehow easier to do. Gonna say. Yeah, I don't know why. They don't take it as seriously yeah. also. But as I said, comedy is really more difficult. Even within the trade crafts, uh, uh, within uh, 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 the film people themselves, they still don't even realize it. I don't know why. It's never quite treated as seriously. And so Jack Lemmon searched for more dramatic material. And Days of Wine and Roses was exactly what he was looking for. A strong dramatic part that would allow him to showcase his range and overall acting talents, but thanks to the involvement of Blake Edwards, not a complete departure from his usual roles and with some room to inject his signature comedic style into the character. However, there was one slight problem. Jack Lemmon was a very good friend of Cliff Robertson and obviously didn't want to take this prestigious role away from him. But after 20th Century Fox made it clear that Robertson, who was still largely unknown at the time, would not be cast under any circumstances, Jack Lemmon finally agreed to do it. I knew that I wanted to play this part more than any part I have ever been lucky enough to play. I've forgotten when I saw Cliff sometime after that, but I believe before we did the film and he totally understood and wished me all the luck in the world. Cliff Robertson was obviously disappointed with this casting decision but also made sure that something like this wouldn't happen to him again, later buying the rights to another TV production he appeared in to guarantee his involvement in a potential movie version. Which did work out quite well for him. The winner is Cliff Robertson in charge. Robertson's co-star Piper Laurie was equally not invited to recreate her part. She would work with Paul Newman in The Hustler and even became an Academy Award nominee one year prior to Lee Remick, but by the time of Piper's Best Actress nod, the casting process for Days of Wine and Roses was already over and Lee Remick had been in more high profile productions in the last couple of years that simply made her a bigger name with movie audiences. Plus she had already worked with Blake Edwards earlier that year on the film noir thriller Experiment in Terror and Edwards was very keen to work with her again on Days of Wine and Roses. Especially because the casting of Jack Lemmon also called for a different type of actress than Piper Laurie who is often hard, serious and domineering on the screen. 20th Century Fox, however, wanted to promote Days of Wine and Roses as a romantic drama and therefore needed an actress who would not only fit the style of Blake Edwards, but also be a believable love interest for Lemon's more goofy personality. The curious thing, I saw Cliff Robertson and Piper Laurie do yes. it. Now, I think, was that for Playhouse 90? Yes, it was. Well, Live. How, it was wonderful. How, I mean, they did a remarkable they job. They certainly I mean, it was, did. And I thought, they were, they, were, they were right on, they were excellent in the role, then why would they turn around and make a movie with you and Jack Lemmon when they did a good job? I can't answer that. The ways and wife wars of uh, who does what 
for whom, where. All I know is that they, I got a call one day from my agent saying uh, they're going to make, it was Fox, I guess it was, is going to make a movie of Days of Wine and Roses and with Jack Lemmon, would you like to be in it? I said, yes. <laughs> I, do, I don't know why they didn't ask mm. Cliff and Piper Laurie to do it at the time, but, uh, yeah. and, you know, sadly for them, uh, we did it instead, but uh, that's the way it up. goes. It's held up really well. Yes, it does. It's, well, it's a good piece and a wonderful subject you know, to deal with. It really was. It was a treat to do. Before shooting could begin, the production would switch from 20th Century Fox to Warner Brothers, as the former studio was too busy with a little project called Cleopatra. But the making of the movie went overall very smoothly and without any difficulties. Jack Lemmon admired Lee Remick's talents and dedication and would later say about her, there is nobody I have respected more or learned more from. Both actors would also conduct excessive research for their parts. While Lee Remick had begun her career without any formal training, she had by now, most likely also due to her work with Ilya Kazan, joined the actor's studio and adopted its dedicated approach, spending weeks at AA meetings to get the necessary insight for her role. I discovered that groups of people thus affected are in other ways fine, decent human beings. And if they are strong, they are stronger indeed than those of us who don't have a liquor problem. All the preparation by Jack Lemmon and Lee Remick certainly paid off as far as the critics were concerned, who showered both actors with some of the best reviews of their careers. Newspapers stated that Jack Lemmon and Lee Remick give complex performances that are forceful, controlled and even waywardly charming and stand among the great movie drunks. Lee Remick herself was praised for leaving an undeniable impression, first rate and brilliant, and that she maintained a core of integrity at the base of her being, even in scenes of poignant despair and degradation. However, even with all this praise, there's no denying that, if anyone walked away with the movie from the critic's point of view, it was Jack Lemmon. Almost all reviews focused exclusively on him, describing him as the best actor working today, complimenting his versatility and declaring him a runaway favorite for an Oscar nomination and most likely the award itself. Many articles almost completely overlooking Lee Remick, while others stated that she was not in his league, overshadowed by his powerful work and that she suffered from a severely underwritten part. So if you want to use a feud quote here, Lee Remick might have felt a little bit like this. It's like I wasn't even in the goddamn picture. But of course, the positive notes for her performance were ultimately enough to lend Lee Remick the only Oscar nomination of her career. And what certainly also helped her in this regard was the fact that Days of Wine and Roses itself was also very positively received. Many reviews calling it powerful, hunting and superior to The Lost Weekend and it also made a significant cultural impact, shedding a new light on the topic of alcoholism and the importance of Alcoholics Anonymous. Miss Remick, of course, is in New York because, was it Thursday? Thursday, I have a film opening at the uh, Radio City Music Hall. The Days, Days of Wine and Roses. Days of Wine and Roses yeah. with Jack Lemmon, yes. So you came to New York for your opening? Yes, very excited about it. Well, I should think you would be. Yes. I must say you should be very excited about a career that is no, properly no, described no. as meteoric. Everything oh, you've done. Oh, right. well, thank you. I enjoy it. I love every minute. So with all this talk about how Lee Remick's performance was received in 1962, what do I think of her? Well, let me start by saying that describing Lee Remick as merely the fifth nominee in this lineup is absolutely out of place, because she belongs into this group just as much as anybody else for a truly heartbreaking and devastating piece of work. Like her co-nominee Geraldine Page, Lee Remick actually had to overcome various challenges to be a success in her role. While Geraldine Page needed to both reject and embrace the cliches of her role for the sake of the story arc, Lee Remick was faced with various shifts in her character that too often make her seem like a passive presence in somebody else's story, while also having to present her own inevitable downfall as the movie's most harrowing aspect. I'd like to go some nice place and have a drink. The difficulties of the character of Kirsten can be explained best when comparing the role in the movie version of Days of Wine and Roses with the original TV version. Here, Kirsten is already an experienced drinker when she meets Joe for the first time at an office party, and both characters constantly choose to go down their path of self-destruction together. In the movie version, on the other hand, Kirsten starts completely differently, initially not interested in having a drink at all, but the relationship with Joe slowly turns her into an alcoholic herself. 
On the one hand, this obviously gives Lee Remick a bigger arc to play. From the more optimistic love interest in the beginning, to a hopeless addict in the end. But on the other hand, Kirsten in the movie is often reduced to an almost passive bystander in her own downfall. Starting to drink when Joe asks her to, stopping and then starting again when Joe asks her to, stopping and starting again when Joe asks her to, before she ultimately cannot stop anymore. It is an arc that has its pros and cons. Kirsten as the master of her own demise offers more intriguing opportunities to Piper Laurie in the TV version, while Kirsten as essentially a victim of circumstances leaves undoubtedly the bigger emotional impact. Oh, it's good. Ooh. It is. On top of that, the newly added scenes in the movie version that display the beginning of the relationship between Joe and Kirsten sometimes make it hard for Lee Remick to find a constant tone in her work. She actually has a very intriguing entrance because her open dislike of Joe is played surprisingly decisive and without any sugar coating. And honestly, given Joe's behavior, totally justified. But of course the script demands her to change this attitude to the charming love interest basically from one moment to the next. And while both extremes work in Lee Remick's performance, the connection seems to miss. Mr. Clay? I... I thought you were going to ask me to dinner. But despite all these challenges in her work, it's still impossible to deny the absolute effectiveness of Lee Remick in her part. From the romantic comedy Kirsten in the beginning, to the devastated alcoholic at the end. Can't ever drink. Too good to ever drink with me. What they do to that that AA place anyway? Aren't you a man anymore? Can't you hear a woman calling you? I'm a woman. Can't you hear me? Lee Remick can also never be accused of taking the easy way in her performance. She doesn't let the effectiveness of the part dictate her work, but instead injects Kirsten with her own style and rhythm. And without ever being too soft. As already mentioned, she can be vehemently opposed to Joe as a person, without any subtle hints of interest, and she always uses her own personality to suggest a troubled soul behind the sweet smiles. A woman desperate for the acceptance of her father, uncertain why she cannot find any human connection, and never able to completely hide her true self. And the strange thing is, my father doesn't talk. Oh, he used to talk to my mother. When I was a little girl, he'd, he'd talk to her in a low, low voice after I'd gone to bed at night. Like Geraldine Page, Lee Remick also suffers from the fact that she stars in a movie that is clearly more interested in her male co-star. But while Geraldine Page still dominated her movie by sheer presence, Lee Remick is never able to outshine Jack Lemmon who, as reviews at the time correctly stated, gives one of the best performances of his career. But Lee Remick wisely also never tries to outshine Jack Lemmon, making their relationship of equals the central aspect of the movie, always working in perfect harmony with his comedic or dramatic style. And while Jack Lemmon might be the movie's most memorable aspect, she never steps into the background, but is always right by his side. Supposed to want to come. I know your milk. milk. Yeah, well, what is that bit? Anyhow, it's the twentieth century. They invented milk bottles, and they got they get milk in cans. It's as good as that milk. You're gonna ruin your shape. The ultimate downfall of Kirsten is maybe made more emotional by her more drastic arc, as well as Lee Remick's engaging and appealing screen presence. But as mentioned before, she never rests on this, but always adds important nuances and characteristics to her role without ever overdoing it, making Kirsten feel completely natural and organic. Lee Remick excels in tasks such as a believable laughing fit or being believably drunk, always bringing a realistic desperation to every situation. You get out of here! You get out of here! You leave my daddy alone! Me, 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 me. And when Kirsten finally admits that she cannot stop drinking, Lee Remick has beautifully completed this devastating arc, showing a woman so clearly different from the beginning of the movie, making her downfall an unforgettable, and shattering experience. Take care of yourself. Lee Remick would later describe the Academy Awards as inspiring and frightening. But even if she did not win the Oscar, 1962 and 1963 clearly saw her arrival as a true prestige actress and Hollywood star. Besides her acclaim for Days of Wine and Roses, she was also a prominent item in the gossip columns due to speculations that she would replace Marilyn Monroe in Something's Gotta Give. She herself, however, would later dismiss the story as a publicity stunt. I was involved with the film for 20 minutes. 
So Lee Remick was by now a household name that could, in a way, compete with Marilyn Monroe and she had proven that her openness, directness and charming personality was ideal for lighter roles but that she also possessed an ability to portray deep complexities and inner trouble, making her a perfect fit for more dramatic material as well. So why was 1962 not the beginning of something but ultimately the peak? To answer this question, we need to get back a couple of years to the start of Lee Remick's career. Despite her background as, essentially, an Eastern socialite, she was immediately typecast as a young Southern type, combining innocence and all American virtues with sexual innuendo, and doing it very convincingly. Audiences and critics would therefore not only be interested in Lee Remick for her natural acting talents, but also for what newspapers called, quote, her blend of the innocence of youth and the sensuality of womanhood. To get the most out of Lee Remick's non-threatening on-screen sexuality, 20th Century Fox created a big publicity campaign to further strengthen this first image and, quote, blow her up to gigantic proportions, and labeled Lee Remick as America's answer to Brigitte Bardot. Which certainly sounds weird, but Lee Remick was actually not supposed to be a new Brigitte Bardot, but rather the antithesis of her. Sure, also sexual, but in a, quote, American way. Clean, sweet, wholesome, as pretty and healthy as a girl in a milk ad. Executives at 20th Century Fox would explain, what this business needs is a new brand of sex appeal. 15 years ago, we had Betty Grable. Then we came up with Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield. Now we think we can make it with Lee Remick. Are you a sex symbol? <laughs> Thank you for asking, I hope so. Mm. Yeah. I'd like to know who you have in mind, dear. Uh -huh. <laughs> By this point, you probably also thought that descriptions like blending innocence of youth and sensuality of womanhood are quite icky, and you are very right. And Lee Remick herself was definitely not a fan either, and not shy to talk about it. She made it quite clear, right from the beginning of her career, that she hated being reduced to an image and her looks just as much as comparisons to any other actress and always insisted that she only wanted to be an actress and not a glamour girl. The only comparison she would humorously allow in interviews was to Greta Garbo, because she had equally big feet. Well, if this isn't a beautiful girl, there are some very false whistlers in this audience. <laughs> are you a beautiful girl? Ah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, Miss Francis. Thank you. For Lee Remick, it was therefore very important to change the stereotype of a young southern siren, saying, I have made six films and played a southerner in four of them. That is the one thing I don't want to do anymore. For Lee Remick, Days of Wine and Roses was therefore actually just as important as it was to Jack Lemmon. It was a chance to prove herself, to do something else. If Jack Lemmon wanted to show that he could do heavy drama just as easily as comedy, Lee Remick relished the opportunity to finally get a part that did not focus on her looks in any way. And the media did indeed not only applaud her performance after the release of Days of Wine and Roses, but also her willingness to de-glam and play a role that asked her to dive deep into mental but also physical devastation. Lee Remick certainly benefited in her quest for more challenging roles from the changing times as the strict glamour type of the 50s was left behind and various prominent actresses, who had mostly been reduced to their looks, began to actively seek more challenging or controversial material. Lee Remick herself explained her success in Days of Wine and Roses with, I've ridden on the current wave of casting against type. You know what your problem is? Uh, <laughs> you are really too pretty. Oh, really God. too pretty. And when you were very, very young, that they didn't take you seriously. They didn't know the capacity that you had because you had that pretty little doll-like face. Did yes, that cause you any problems? Some, yes. I know that there were times along the way where um, I didn't uh, have the opportunity to play a particular thing and I don't know what offhand at the moment, but I know that I did lose roles here and there because they said, oh, no, 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 she's too pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it also stood me in good stead oh, yes. through my life. Oh, yes. It doesn't hurt, really. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> However, while Lee Remick was able to demonstrate her range in 1962, not only with Days of Wine and Roses, but also Experiment in Terror, 20th Century Fox seemed unsure on how to move forward. 
Not only because she rejected the kinds of roles the studios most likely would have considered for her as a new star, but also because she rejected stardom in general. Yes, she loved to act, but the limelight, the center stage, the gossip columnists, the life in the public eye and everything else usually attached to stardom was an absolute nightmare for her, often refusing any publicity or interviews and preferring to live as quietly and anonymously as possible, saying, I don't relish the idea of being recognized here and there and being sort of splashed over. It begins to take people's lives over to an alarming degree and I knew that instinctively. The idea frightened me. I do love to do what I do, but I don't want to be that kind of public property. And this is finally the main reason why Lee Remick's career did not really take off after her success in 1962. Because she did not want it to. For her, acting was a job, but nothing more. And also a job that always came second to her private life. Getting married in 1958 and having a first child in 1959, Lee Remick deliberately slowed down her career right from the beginning and would keep this attitude for the rest of her life. I'm a wife and mother above everything else. A housewife who is incidentally an actress. I suppose I could have made twice as many films, but I was well aware of how one's personal life could be jeopardized. Of course, Lee Remick's attitude to see her work as an actress of secondary importance was made more easy for her due to her own background of financial stability, saying, I may lack drive because I never had to struggle in that way. And because she saw acting only as a job and lacked any serious ambition to reach the top of Hollywood, she would also never truly chase scripts or parts, stating instead that she was always waiting for what would be offered to her. Ilya Kazan later said about Lee Remick, I don't know that being a star means much to Lee, or that she has the claws to get ahead in Hollywood. She's an extremely warm, decent and charming human being, but in an actress, these qualities can almost be limitations. All this explains why, following Days of Wine and Roses, she did not actively launch herself into stardom or chase after more prestigious dramatic roles and why 20th Century Fox did also not promote her any further as its next big thing. Knowing that she refused more roles than she accepted and would not conduct any publicity campaigns for either herself or her films, she slowly stepped back into the second row of priorities. And again, for Lee Remick, this was just fine. Especially since heavy dramatic parts were the last thing on her mind following Days of Wine and Roses, feeling emotionally and physically exhausted from her role. I forget everything else but the character I'm playing. If ever an actress worked into the mood for a film, I did for that one. I felt I just had to get out of my emotional fog. She was therefore more interested in lighter material and would appear in the western satire The Hallelujah Trail and the romantic comedy The Wheeler Dealers. Always being keen to not only work on the big screen, she would also go to Broadway various times in her career, sometimes not very successfully. And when we finally opened in New York, we were all exhausted, but I have to say it was all worth it because the run of that show was six of the happiest days of my life. <laughs> but sometimes with a lot of success. For example, when she originated the part of Susie Hendricks in Wait Until Dark. It was a role that she loved to play and hoped to also appear in the eventual movie version, but when Mel Ferrer acquired the movie rights, it was immediately clear that Audrey Hepburn would be cast instead, causing some media outlets to draw comparisons between Lee Remick and Julie Andrews as two actresses who both lost their stage roles to Audrey. Wait Until Dark is the... Uh play in which Miss Remick is starring at the Barrymore Theatre, which always tickles me, oh. the Barrymore Theatre. It must be a wonderful Oh, it's beautiful. I love it, yes. And, uh, and she plays a blind girl. I do. Yeah. Beautifully. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm enjoying it. It's great fun. After divorcing her first husband in 1968, Lee Remick married British film producer William Gowans in 1970 and moved to London with him and her children. From now on, she consequently appeared mostly in British TV productions, preferring them to the offers from the US. I find that I'm playing a wider variety of roles than I did in the States. Her TV work as Lady Randolph Churchill would be one of her most praised performances in her later career, winning her both a Golden Globe and a BAFTA. During this time, she also appeared in the biggest financial hit of her career, The Omen, but she herself simply commented on it, I'm just glad to be working. 
When the offers in the UK did not meet Lee Remick's demands anymore, she moved back to the US in the early 80s, hoping to get the leading role in Robert Redford's Ordinary People, but again mostly focused on TV work, unsatisfied with the movie scripts offered to her, which she often called garbage. But she would find another happy experience when she again worked opposite Jack Lemmon in Tribute. She's just, it's like we picked up from where we were 18 years yeah, ago yeah. in the other film. And, and uh, uh, she's got the same enthusiasm, mm -hmm. the same pace of speaking. There is no aging process yeah. in that girl, it's amazing. Two of you created movie history <laughs> with well, your first picture, Days we were, of Wine and Roses. We had a wonderful time that time and, uh, and this time as well. He, was it just like picking up again and renewing? It was it? actually. It was as though, I mean, that's 15, 16 years ago or something like that that right. we did Wine and Roses. And uh, we haven't worked together since. And it was as though that 15 intervening years had never happened. It was just there we were again working together and speaking the same language and and dealing with the material at hand in, in much the same way. It was, it was marvelous. Lee Remick also originated the role of Dr. Livingston in the play Agnes of God opposite Geraldine Page during its pre-Broadway run, but unsatisfied with the writing of her part, left the production before it opened in New York. In 1989, Lee Remick was then tragically diagnosed with kidney cancer. She herself handled her illness with the same grace and dignity as everything else in life, saying, you become far more aware of how delicate it is, how it's not going to go on forever. I learned what matters and what doesn't. One of her last public appearances was in April 1991, when she received a star on the Walk of Fame. She died only a few weeks later, at the age of 55. She was asked once about the wide range of characters she portrayed on the screen. I just look for the stuff that interests me, she explained, and I don't like to repeat. When she received her star on the Walk of Fame, Gregory Peck said about Lee Remick, she plays her roles with an open heart, an open mind, keen intelligence and a depth of feeling that takes the play acting out of her work and makes the event on the screen appear to be real. For an actress seemingly without a manic, driving obsession for more success, more acclaim, more publicity, Lee has built a body of work that has won her the respect and affection of her colleagues and of the public. Stephen Sondheim remembered her equally fondly after her death. She was the consummate professional in everything she did and a terrific lady. And any other observation I would have would sound like a personal advertisement for her, which she sorely deserved. Lee Remick might never have turned into an icon on the big screen, but it's comforting to realize that she never intended to be, that she preferred to live according to her own rules and always found fulfillment in both her professional and private life. She described her approach to acting as, there aren't any rules for what we do, except you absorb everything and do your best. And this she certainly always did, leaving lasting impressions in small and big parts, and while it is painful to think about all the wonderful performances she could have given if her life had not ended so suddenly, the work she has left us remains a powerful reminder of her wonderful talents and captivating screen persona.